you, Skyler. Good morning and welcome to Geist Christian Church. My name is Ryan Hazen. I'm the lead pastor of this campus. It's good to welcome you this morning. If this is your first service of worship with us, a special welcome to you, whether that's in this place or worshiping with us online. If you're in this place and you're new to our community, I hope you'll make your way after worship through these double sets of doors to my right. There's an information center there. Uh, Jenny will be at the, at the Welcome Center after worship, and uh, we'd be delighted to put some information in your hands about our mission and ministry as one church in two locations here at our Mud Creek campus, also at our Promise Road campus in Fishers. I do hope that everyone, whether you're worshiping in this place or online, will f- let us know you're here and register any prayer concerns that you might have. If you're in this place, you can do that with a card that's in the pew racks in front of you. Place those along with your offering in the offering plates uh, near the back of the sanctuary as you leave. If you're online, there's a way to do that through a QR code, or uh, you can go to geistchristian.org here and register your attendance and any prayer concerns that way. I do hope that everyone has uh, gathered something for communion. If you're online worshiping with us to gather something that will represent the the bread and the cup. If you're in this place, I hope you've picked up uh, a communion kit. If not, please slip out and do that. Kyle Brown, our associate minister, will welcome us around the table later in the service. A couple of announcements. Uh, Tonight in this place will be our journey from lost to living. It is our grief service that we do every year on the first Sunday of December. It's at six o'clock this evening. Uh, If you've lost someone or if you want to come and support those that have, um, I hope that you would come to that service this evening. It will be online as well, same um, YouTube channel, Mud Creek Live, at 6 o'clock this evening. Also, next Sunday is Music Sunday, Uh, so a couple of pieces of good news about that. You don't have to listen to me preach, so that's good news number one. Good news number two is we will have orchestra and choir and bell choirs. They'll begin the prelude about 15 minutes before the the time. So so if you're coming to the 9 o'clock service, about 8.45. If you're coming to the 10.30 service, uh, about 10.15. I can do that math real quickly. So uh, we will also start the live stream about 10.15 next week so that uh, you can enjoy the music, and I'm looking forward to that. I also want to say a word, uh, those of you that are in this place, I hope that you'll take a look at uh, a piece of art that we have out in the Great Hall. It's just to the left of the baptistry. Um, Eliza is back. Can you stand up and wave? She's right in the back. And that's her piece of art that she created, and it's called Hallelujah, and I think it's wonderful. Uh, so I wanted, I asked her if, if she could uh, contribute that to let it be on loan to the church, uh, like a big museum. Uh, so I hope you'll take a look at that after worship today. Today, we, uh, as we stand together and sing, I will be lighting the second Advent candle. It is the candle of peace. So let's stand together and sing our opening hymn, Come, O Long Expected Jesus, all verses. It's number 125 in the hymnal or on the screens.
Good morning. Let us pray. Loving God, we come here on this second Sunday of Advent to continue our spiritual preparation for the celebration of Jesus' birth. Lord, we know there are many distractions at this time of year that can divert our attention away from the true meaning of Christmas. And so we ask for your help in keeping us focused on Christ's coming and in preparing us for the full joy of Christmas. Open our hearts and make us receptive to hearing your word and seeking your love and guidance. And as we heard in last week's sermon, help us to make room in our hearts for the Christ child, Jesus, our Lord and Savior, and the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> seated. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Malachi, the third chapter, verses 1 through 4. And you can find this on page 889 in the Old Testament section of your pew Bibles. See, I am sending my messenger to prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant in whom you delight indeed, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will set as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the descendants of Levi and refine them like gold and silver until they present offerings to the Lord in righteousness." Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Thank you. 
Thank you. A foretaste of next Sunday. In our prayers this day, we lift up um, Joni Schneider, who had surgery on Monday and is home and doing well. Let us go to God in prayer. God of time and hope, we are rushing headlong into the holidays to come, and we wonder if there is time for everything. You are a God of time and hope. You bring hope to us, as you always have, through the voices of prophets, and now through the one who is to come. Remind us again that this season is about hope and peace, joy and love. Calm us, slow us down, help us to remember that it is in loving relationship that you gave your son to us. And in loving relationship that your word is carried with us to the hearts of all people. God, we lift our global community in prayer as the pandemic continues. Be with those who fight the fight against it each and every day. In our own community, we know there are those who carry burdens, those who come to this holiday without someone dear. Hear our prayers, O oh God. We offer prayers of healing for Joni as she recovers. Be with her. Shine in the hearts of your people. Bless those in need with healing and reconciling strength with your presence and love. Give those who face difficult situations your peace and your compassion. These prayers we offer in confidence and gratitude of your love and presence in Christ's name. Amen. Last week, we embarked on the journey of Advent that leads us to Christmas. We started a series called Housing the Holy, the Inn, to prepare us to house the holy in our homes and in our lives. We lit the first candle of hope and read from Jeremiah that new life can come when we make room for Jesus and make room for hope, even when that means moving some things around a little bit like we do when we put up decorations at home or in this place. Today, the second Sunday of Advent is Peace Sunday. The candle and the banner help us remember. Today, we are pulled into the distant past again to hear the words of another ancient prophet, Malachi. Malachi, as the Old Testament is coming to a close, tells of a figure who is coming to prepare the way for the Lord. He tells of one who will refine and purify people's hearts. In the midst of our pre-Christmas hustle and bustle, the scripture today has this primitive prophet who promises an advent clean and polish, like we were taking ourselves to crew car wash for the ultimate. You would think that we could come up with something a little more encouraging at this time, something that would assure us that we will make it through, something a little more like the idyllic pageants of our childhood. And instead, it suggests that we better get busy getting cleaned up before God arrives. In Flannery O'Connor's short story, Revelation, the main character, Mrs. Ruby Turpin, is the domineering spouse of a pig farmer. She's also an appalling racist. She categorizes everybody, black and white, rich and poor, according to an elaborate scale of bigotry that she is constantly adjusting. Worst of all, Ruby Turpin actually views her fondness for making distinctions based on race or class to be one of the great attributes that she possesses. One day, while sitting in the waiting room of her doctor's office expressing gratitude that she is neither black nor poor, Mrs. Turpin is assaulted by a young girl who hits her smack in the middle of the forehead 
with a book, interestingly enough, titled Human Development. And the girl calls her a warthog. This accusation turns Mrs. Turpin's world upside down. Ruby understands this attack not just simply from this deranged teenager, but as a word from God. When Ruby Turpin arrives home from the doctor's office with a bruise on her forehead, she stomps out behind the shed, she picks up a hose, and she begins washing down her pigs with a forceful stream of cold water. She is angry at God. What right does God have to suggest that she, an upstanding citizen, is a warthog? As soon as her husband is out of earshot, Ruby looks to the heavens and growls, Why did you send a message like that? How am I a warthog? How am I saved, she asks. How am I saved? It's one of the most profound theological questions found in American literature since the publication of the Bible. It's also a question that we know quite well this time of year. We may not ask it exactly like that, but there are instances in this season that can show a disconnect between who our words say we are and who our actions say we are. We can spend hours trying to make a good Christmas for our children or grandchildren or other family and then lose patience with them in an instant. I can hum Christmas carols and at the same time wish people would get out of my way in line at Costco. How am I saved? This question testifies to a classic theological formula. God both loves us and judges us. Or perhaps more accurately, because God loves us, God judges us. That is the depth of truth that lies at the heart of Malachi's prophecy. Our gracious God so loves us that God's great desire is to see us freed from the grime that covers our souls. Now, God is not saying, I refuse to let you come in for a visit until you get cleaned up. God is used to having our messy selves around. Instead, God is saying, I'm going to help you clean up. I will help you throw off the tarnish that prohibits you from truly experiencing the joy that awaits you in this season. Who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears, asked the prophet Malachi, for he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. Both of these images are a little frightening. A refiner's fire, that's the forced air, the the white hot blaze that melts metallic ores and brings their impurities to the surface. Fuller's soap is this lye-based soap that's used to bleach the impurities from cloth and wool, wool that's just been sheared off of sheep. So fire and soap is what we need to get ourselves ready for the one that is coming, says Malachi. We are told that the messenger who comes to prepare us for the Lord arrives with flames in one hand and caustic detergent in the other. He comes to boil off the impurities of our souls and apply a coarse scrub brush to our spirits. Merry Christmas! A little known fact is that Malachi was fired from his job of writing Christmas cards for Hallmark. (laughs) I'm kidding, of course. But it does beg the question of why this concern for purification as we head toward Christmas. If you're familiar with Handel's Messiah, you know that George Frederick Handel wrestled with the words as he wrote, but who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire. And later Handel writes, and he shall purify the sons of Levi, that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. 
Who exactly this passage is referring to has been interpreted differently over the years, but if the words, my messenger, in Malachi 3.1 is identified as John the Baptist in its early Christian interpretation, then phrases like the Lord who you seek or the messenger of the covenant become identified with Jesus himself. It is the Lord who is like refiner's fire and fuller's soap. It is he who will purify the people of the covenant. And despite our feelings about the matter and about how distasteful refiner's fire and fuller soap might be to us, it's actually good news. Sin separates us from God. And we need a good cleansing. And we are helpless to do it ourselves. Enter the refiner of gold and the washer of clothes to do the cleansing for us. Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes of this theme of judgment in an Advent sermon. See, I'm not the only one. He preached this in 1928. It is remarkable that we face the thought that God is coming so calmly, whereas previous peoples trembled at the day of God. We have become so accustomed to the idea of divine love and of God's coming at Christmas that we no longer feel the shiver of fear that God's coming should arouse in us. We are indifferent to the message, taking only the pleasant and agreeable out of it and forgetting the serious aspect that the God of the world draws near to the people of our little earth and lays claim to us. The coming of God is truly not only glad tidings, but first of all, a little frightening news for everybody that has a conscience. Only when we have felt that terror of the matter can we comprehend the incomparable kindness of what's happening. God comes into the very midst of evil and death and judges the evil in us and the world, and by judging us, God cleanses and sanctifies us, comes to us with grace and love. At the close of Flannery O'Connor's story, Mrs. Turpin has a vision, a revelation, which is where the title comes from. As she stands outside by her pigs, she sees a ladder on which people are ascending to heaven, walking together in the groups that she has placed them, She and those like her are bringing up the rear of the procession. They are the last, following all of whom she has despised for so long. And O'Connor writes, They alone were on key, yet she could see their shocked and altered faces that even their virtues were being burned away. Sometimes the things that need to be purged from our spirits are precisely those aspects of our life that we are most proud of. We consider to be our strengths, our virtues, when the purifier of souls comes to town. This is the promise of the season. The gift of Malachi is to picture for us a God who lays out fire and soap this Advent, a God who wants to cleanse us from everything that would prevent us from standing in awe at the manger. Why does God do this? Well, one clue might be in O'Connor's story. The name of the girl who throws her book at Ruby Turpin in the doctor's office? Grace. Ruby Turpin wanted to be the one who controlled who was in and who was out. Like the childhood game of musical chairs, we, like Ruby, are always convinced that there's not enough space at the table, not enough room, and we want to make sure that we occupy the chairs first. Yet we are reminded that we are invited to imagine and make real a world where there is room for everyone. I've always been fascinated by the preparation that goes on behind the scenes to prepare for something 
an upcoming event or the arrival of someone. While a student at TCU, and it does my heart good to see two TCU families sitting right across the aisle from each other, good job. While a student at TCU, I worked in a 500-room hotel in downtown Fort Worth. My title was assistant manager, but that sounds way better than it was. I and two other assistant managers took care of problems that might arise when the real manager was not there, evenings, overnights, weekends. Even though we didn't have much authority, we did get to witness the preparation that went into every event, and the bigger the event, the more preparation there was. There was one occasion, likely in 1982 or so, when the owner of the hotel, Sid Bass, announced that the Vice President of the United States, George H.W. Bush, would be a guest at the hotel. Now, the Americana Hotel was a very nice hotel. It was kept in tip-top shape. But when the announcement was made, all the departments kicked into overdrive. The owners and managers worked with the Secret Service to make arrangements. An entire floor of the hotel was blocked off for his visit. The hotel was cleaned like it had not been cleaned before. Curtains were steamed. Tile grout was cleaned. The carpet was shampooed. Everybody got new uniforms. Anybody that was going to be in the vicinity of the vice president had to fill out a long questionnaire. A memo from management suggested that we look our best if we were working the day the vice president would be in the building. I assumed that meant that I should shower and use deodorant and comb my hair that day. Yes, I had hair in 1982. Here's the deal. Someone much greater than the vice president is coming. There are some things that we carry into this season that we might need to clean up a bit. We approach our family gatherings, company parties, burdened sometimes with grudges, hurt feelings, misunderstandings, and we've secretly nurtured those old wounds, allowing them to coat our souls with gunk and grime. God comes to save us. And a part of that process is to purge our souls of the gunk that prevents us from fully welcoming the Christ child. God came to us in Christ so that we might have life and have it abundantly. But in order for that to happen, we have to rid ourselves of the baggage that weighs us down, the mindset that it excludes others from the table, the grievances that we hold against the other. The job of the fuller was to make cloth fuller, more suitable, cleaner for weaving and sewing. In our faith journey from the day of our baptism forward, there should be a constant cleansing to keep our spiritual fibers in the best possible condition. In this season, I hope you will prepare yourselves to welcome Jesus. As for me, I'll take a pass on refiner's fire and fuller's soap. But I will work to ready myself for the one who is coming in this season. Amen.
I recently read something about a, a peace table. Uh, that would have been helpful for me as a kid in elementary school. You see, uh, at a peace table, youth will come together to explain or to talk about the conflict they may have with one another. Uh, when I was in second grade, we used our fists. That was not a good choice, which landed me at a table having to eat with my head on the table, something that I still remember to this day. A peace table would have been helpful for me. It would have been helpful for the child. We had a conflict. We just couldn't see eye to eye. And so people go to this table and they pass a rock back and forth until the issue is resolved. Doesn't it make sense that they would come to a table to work out their problems and to share their emotions? When Jesus gathered with his disciples in that upper room, he did so knowing that there would be conflict. He knew that there would be denial. He knew there would be betrayal. He knew there would be pain. And yet there he was at table with his disciples, passing food and passing drink and making peace with his promise of new life. May we strive this day to find peace within ourselves and within our world as we gather with each other and our God around this table today. For on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples saying, Take and eat, do in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant, poured out for the forgiveness of sin. That as long as you eat of this bread and you drink of this cup, do so in remembrance of me. For these are the gifts of God, and they are for the people of God this day. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Abba, we are so thankful for you. You prepare a way for us through this Advent season to be purified. Just as John and Jesus prepared the way for us to you. Your son has taught us that there is always space at the table and space in our hearts for love for all. We ask you to send the power of the Holy Spirit so that our gifts of bread and wine may be turned into his body and blood and that you renew us with grace and fill us with the joy of your spirit. Amen. You are called this day to the table of grace and love. Come, may we find peace with each other and our God. A couple of weeks ago, we had one of my favorite Sundays during the pandemic. It almost felt like the pandemic had passed. It was Long John Sunday. You were invited to bring Long Johns, and over 400 pair of Long Johns were collected, both at our Mud Creek and Promise Road campuses. It was such a day filled with joy. And then Monday, we got the news that our daughter was COVID positive. All the extremes, from joy to heartache, a harsh reminder that the pandemic is still part of our everyday life. So I had to wait until I could take all those long johns down to Wheeler Mission. It took four large bags filled with long johns in the back of my car. And the look on the individual's faces when I dropped them off was pure joy. 
for the warmth that they would provide during these cold winter nights. There are so many different ways for us to share our time and talent and our gifts, from long johns to quarters to food bags and stockings and hams. Out of an abundance and gifts that God has given us, we are called to respond. And that is what we do when we come to this time of stewardship. We respond to God's abundance and God's grace in our own lives and share with others. So for those gifts that have been given, those gifts that will be given this week, let us stand and sing the doxology this day. My invitation today is this, that if you have been looking for a time to make your first time profession of faith in Jesus Christ, I hope that today might be that day. If you want to know more about what that means, seek out one of the ministers, one of our elders, that we can pray with you about that. By the same token, if you are looking to put down roots in ministry to transfer your membership to this congregation, I'd love to welcome you this day. Uh, as we sing a hymn of invitation, Angels We Have Heard on High, all verses number 155. Let's sing together.
you might have some things that need cleansing. Time is coming short. Christ will be coming into your lives. That's a message for the world, that God can cleanse us. So go, share that with the world in need. Amen.